With a message from God's Word, here's Charles Stanley. You'll turn to Matthew chapter 6, and I want us to read a portion of this chapter. The first verse, the fifth verse, and then beginning in verse 16 through 18. And the title of this message, Prayer and Fasting, and primarily, the fasting is what we want to deal with this morning in the series on prayer. He begins in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 by saying, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Then verse 5 says, And when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Then in verse 18, he's 16, he says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that you may appear not to men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, what he's saying in these first 18 verses, he's talking about giving to the poor, almsgiving. Secondly, he's speaking about prayer. And thirdly, he's talking about fasting. And in all three of these things, he says there are several things for us to watch out for. Number one, he says, you don't do it to be seen of men. Don't be like the hypocrites standing in the public places praying to be seen of men. You don't give in order that others may know how much you give. And you don't fast and walk around with your hair uncombed and your face look like it's unwashed and you've got sleepy in your eye because you've, you've not been fasting and you want to look like you've been sacrificing for God. He says, whatever we do, we should do it in private. And when we do it in private, God will reward us openly. We have to do it out of the motivation of love and out of the motivation to be seen. For he says that anything and everything we do in those areas in order to be seen of men, if you're seen by one person or ten people, the one person that saw you do it, that's all the rewards you're going to get. If a thousand people see it, all that you receive in return is the reward of the commendation or the criticism of a thousand people. And what he's saying is not that our Christian witness should be private, not that our Christian witness should be done in the closet, but that those areas of our expression of toward him, of giving to the poor, of prayer and of fasting should be done secretly in order that God may reward us openly. That is, never the motivation to be seen or to be known or to be praised by others. Now, when you think about the responsibility that you and I have, we are in a warfare, Paul says in chapter, in chapter 6 of Ephesians. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, which says that our battle is a spiritual battle. We have personal, private, spiritual battles with Satan. We have spiritual battles that develop in relationships with other people. We have a spiritual battle going on in this nation right now to save it or to lose it. And so we have specific weapons that God has given us in order to do battle. He says, first of all, we have his name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Paul said, or Peter said, rise up and walk. We have the word of God to stand upon as our promise and the foundation of our request before the Lord. We have the blood of Jesus Christ upon which we can walk and uh, upon which we are protected. But we have likewise prayer as a tool and as a weapon, fasting as a weapon. We have praise as a weapon. We have faith as a weapon so that the people of God are adequately equipped to do what God has called us to do. So what I want us to notice here, first of all, are some principles about fasting. And first of all is this. We do not fast in order to avoid obeying God. Whenever he requires us to fast or when we feel compelled or burdened to do so, you don't fast over here and say, Lord, now I'm, I'm sacrificing my time and my food over here. And God is saying, well, what I want you to look at is what's over here. And you say, Lord, but I want you to see that I'm sacrificing and I'm proving to you how obedient I am. Obedience in fasting will never atone for sin over here and disobedience because genuine fasting always 
causes me to look within to see, Lord, is my heart right with you? So you don't fast to avoid obeying God in a given area. Secondly, fasting is for the purpose of bringing the body into subjection. We all have appetites. We have appetites, of, of physical appetites to eat. We have appetites to enjoy beauty. There are sexual appetites. There are all kinds of appetites that God has given us to be exercised or fulfilled within the limits of the boundaries of his word. But there are times when he says we're to set aside all appetites, we're to put them all aside in order to seek him for a specific reason or a specific purpose. So, we're to bring the body into subjection. That means we are to bring our body to the point that more important than eating and a greater desire than to eat is to talk to the Father. Now, you've seen people say, oh my goodness, it's 12 o'clock, it's time for lunch. I'm hungry. They never even thought about being hungry until they watched the clock. Many things we do, we do out of habit, not because they're necessary needs. And one of the reasons that God wants us to fast is to bring the body into subjection for a deeper spiritual purpose. Our third principle here is that fasting brings the soul, the mind, the will, the emotion, the conscience, the consciousness, under submission to the spirit within us so that more important than our normal life patterns is something that God may want to say or do in our life. So when you think about how many things you hear in a given day, all the things that come your way, how many layers upon layers upon layers of thought patterns and ideas and little habits that you and I fall into and ever dawn upon us, that we are almost sometimes the victim of our own habits that we think are good. But for God to get our attention and to get way down on the inside of us and to speak to us on a deeper level than happens day by day, fasting focuses our attention upon God the Father, focuses our attention upon our own sinfulness, and we get a whole new glimpse of what life is all about. And then a fourth principle involved here is this, that fasting, fasting has a tremendous effect upon us when we begin to seek the Lord in worship. And we're willing to fast. Now, what in the world would happen if you and I began to fast on Saturdays before we came to the Lord's house on Sunday? I'll tell you. I can't tell you exactly what would happen, but I can tell you this. It would never be normal again, whatever normal is. Because when people fast and pray and they begin to seek God, and He becomes the priority of their thinking, the priority of their feeling, the priority of their actions, the priority of their behavior, something begins to happen not only to them, but to everybody around them. So there's some principles here that God has given us all through the Scripture. Now what I'd like to do for the rest of the time is to share with you for a few moments the purposes. Why is it that God wants us to fast? Now He said in this passage here that He certainly does not want us to do it in order to be seen of men then what is the real purpose that God has in mind? And the first one is this, and that is that our spirit, that our spirit would be disciplined toward the things of the Father. Now you recall when Jesus was uh, tempted in the wilderness, it followed his baptism, a tremendous highlight in his life, and then 40 days of seeking the mind of the Father before he began his ministry. And no doubt, in his own human as well as his physical because he did have hungers and thirst and appetites like we do. But 40 days and 40 nights of disciplining his human aspect of himself, his human body, in order to find the mind of his father, to know the mind of his father before he began that time of ministry for three years whereby the whole world and all of eternity would be changed. But what about us? He didn't have to deal with sin. He didn't have to deal with an old carnal nature such as we, though he was tempted by Satan. But fasting brings our spirituality to a point that it becomes the priority. The body, the soul of man is under subjection, and we discipline ourselves in order to bring ourselves in a position where that he might be able to bring us to reach the maximum of our potential. Now, you can live a Christian life and walk in the Spirit without ever fasting. But what fasting does to prayer, it intensifies it. It makes it possible for us to reach down in the innermost being of our spirit and to feel legitimately and rightly and accurately and precisely what oftentimes we cannot feel. Haven't you heard people say, well, I don't know what I'm feeling. I can't quite distinguish what I'm feeling. Fasting sifts. Fasting prunes. 
Fasting peels off layer after layer after layer after layer of feelings and attitudes and experiences and thoughts. And so often we can't really get down to the hardcore of what God is trying to say to us. Fasting is a disciplining of the spirit. A second purpose for fasting is this, and that is to find the will of God for your life in a given situation. For example, let's say that you're contemplating marriage. Do you know that's the will of God for your life or you sort of think it is? You say, well, I've prayed and I've talked to this one and I've been counseled by that one. Let me suggest something. If you'll take three days, and it may be difficult for you, you may have to work up for the three days. If you'll take three days in the Word of God alone on your face before Him and fasting and praying, and I mean without food but drink water, and you begin to seek the Lord and tell Him that you want Him to show you in His Word, I guarantee you whatever you seek in the mind of God about, whatever it may be, if you will fast and pray, bringing the body and the soul in subjection to Him and submission to Him, He will clear your eyesight, He'll clear your ears, he'll clear your heart, he'll clear your spirit, your focus of attention will be upon him, and you'll be able to hear from God what you've never heard before. It'll come very, very clear, very precisely, very accurately. You will know for an absolutely uncertain, without any doubt whatsoever, this is what God wants me to do. That's exactly what Daniel did. When he was fasting and praying in that ninth chapter, tremendous chapter on fasting and praying, he said, God, I don't know what the answer is, but I want to know. The Bible says he set himself to fast and pray before the Lord. And you see, there is a sacrifice. There is a giving up. There is a surrendering. There is a subjecting of the body and the spirit. But you see, what we have to ask is, Lord, do I want to reach my potential for you? Or am I willing to be satisfied to grope around down here and have the applause and the praise and the pleasing of others? Or do I want to reach my maximum? Am I willing to bring this body, this soul, this spirit in absolute and total subjection to you that whatever you want to do in my life, God, I'll be fit and ready. And not only that, I'll know what you want to do. You see, if enough people are willing to get on their face before God and to seek his mind, God will show us how to change this nation. He'll show us how to put homes back together. He'll show us how to become the catalyst to set fires in churches and homes all over America. But you see, we've got another mind of God. And the reason it burdens me is this. Usually, 99% of the time, what is the natural, normal way of doing a thing isn't God's way at all. So how do you find out how to do it? You've got to find His mind. And we can't rush around seven days a week doing our thing and find the mind of God. Not very often. About major things, not very often at all. There's another purpose he has in mind here, and that is genuine personal repentance and confession before him. For example, let's say that you've got a habit in your life that you just can't overcome. Or let's say that there's a given area in your life in which Satan has a stronghold. I mean, he doesn't have a little toehold. He's got a tremendous stronghold in your life. In fact, he's just got one whole big whopping section of you. And you're saying, Lord, I've prayed, I've read the Bible, I've been counseled, I'm trying to walk in the Spirit. Why is it that I can't get victory over this thing in my life? Here's what happens. When you begin to fast, and sometimes it'll be like hell on earth the first few hours, because Satan will attack you. Listen, I don't mean that all fasting's that way, but if you go to God telling him that you want freedom, you want liberty, you want victory, you want healing in the inner man, and you begin to fast, you can just watch it. Satan calls for every demonic power that is available for attack, and he's going to attack you, and here's what he's going to say. You don't think that's going to work, do you? And besides that, it's almost time for lunch. Listen to your stomach growl. <laughs> what is your wife or your husband going to think? What are your children going to think? And after all, the Bible says you shouldn't do it in public, and, and your family already knows that you're going to fast today or tomorrow, the next three days. They know you've gone away for three days. And they, you don't think God's going to answer. I'll tell you, he'll put every evil, diabolical, wicked thought he can come up with, and he's got gobs of them to cause you to doubt, to do anything he can to get you, get you up off your knees because Satan knows what is God going to do. He's going to reveal sin that we do not normally see. He's going to strip us open inside and out, lay us bare. We're going to look upon him, and we see him, we're going to see ourselves. When we see ourselves in the light of seeing him, we're going to see sin and wickedness and carnality in our heart we've never seen before. But that's part of the process. When we begin to see what's inside of us in the light of what he's like, and we confess and repent of this, and God cleanses our life out and gets us straightened out, friends, you become a, become a powerhouse for God. 
God is going to move in your life as he's never moved before. There is no incident in the Bible of people fasting and praying and repenting toward God without the release of God's supernatural power in their life. And you see, what we take for granted, and one of the problems in this country is we've got too much. The real truth is that most of the nations in the world, the people are fasting every day anyway. The problem is they don't have anything to eat. And friends, we're so blessed. We've got it coming and going, three meals a day, four or five snacks, you name it, you can buy a drink of this and a piece of that and a bar of that and one of these and one of these and any little machine anywhere in this country. You can find all you want to eat and more than most Americans need. I'll tell you something interesting in the Bible. How many times you'll see the relationship between overeating and sin. And you just take Israel, they got across the Red Sea, the Bible says they met together and they ate and they rose up to play and all kinds of whoredoms and all kinds of things began to happen. There is something about the human body that Satan takes advantage of. They're all legitimate appetites. But if Satan can get one of them off balance, if he can get one of them perverted, if he can get one of them over here on some avenue and we begin to focus on that, then he wipes us out. Very important if we're going to get right with God. And you say, I'm not saying that you have to fast every time you confess, but I want to ask you this. Are you one of those persons who's saying, I want to be everything God wants me to be. But somehow I just can't do that. I want to, but I can't break out. In fact, I don't even know what it is that has me chained. I don't even know what it is that keeps holding me back. I just know what I want to be. I know what I believe God wants me to do, and I can't do it. Then I want to challenge you to start with one day. Take a Saturday, if that's your day off, what it may be, and you just say to your wife quietly, don't make any big to-do out of it, honey. I want to just fast the day, or if you're a wife and you want to do that, you tell your family, your husband, to look, I'm willing to cook uh, three meals today if necessary, but it would certainly be easier on me if I didn't have to go in the kitchen uh, today and just be by myself alone to pray, and husband, surely you'll take the kids out and do whatever's necessary. Won't hurt you to cook. Ha, ha, ha. I teach you to appreciate your wife a little more. And you just take care of that while she sets aside a time to pray. Or if the husband and wife want to take a time of fasting and praying together. Or the whole family fast and pray. God will do something supernatural in your life and in your family. And friend, there is a power released when you fast and pray that does not come any other way. Look in the Bible to see what he says. Then there is the concern over a nation, the concern over a nation to protect the nation. And one of the most beautiful of all chapters is Second Chronicles chapter 20, when Jehoshaphat heard the enemy was coming, the Bible says he fell on his face before God, called for fasting and praying, and he prayed before God, before the whole congregation of Israel, and when he finished this prayer, God spoke to a prophet who was standing in the congregation, and he stood up and told him what to do. And they did the most unnatural thing. They got the army together. They got the choir. They put the choir in the front of the army. The natural, normal thing to do was put the choir up on the hill where everybody could see them with all their trumpets on one side and the singers on the other. And the, and the armies would go out inspired by the choir and the, and the orchestra up on the bank where it was very safe. Jehoshaphat said, God said, put the choir and the orchestra in the front of the army. Well, you can ama be amazed, or, or you, can, you can imagine how amazed the enemy were when the choir came out first. <laughs> but you see, it put him in confusion. God defeated him, but he didn't do it the natural, normal way. And you see, God will save this country. God can change this nation. God can send a tremendous sweeping revival in America. But I want to tell you, he's going to have to do it his way. And the only way for him to do it, for him to get all the glory and praise and honor, is for people to pray. If God sent some sweeping mighty evangelist through America to start a revival, we give him all the credit. We do it anyway. We are prone to give people credit. God wants glory, not men having credit. And when we fall on our face before God and weep and confess and repent and praise and sing, God is going to hear that it's sweet to him because he knows his people are getting honest with him. Another thing, another purpose for, for uh, fasting is this, and that is a concern for God's work. 
And you'll recall in uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, when Nehemiah, who was the cupbearer of Artaxerxes, the scripture says that he was serving the king, and of course he was a, uh, uh, he was a, um, uh, not a, he was a prisoner, but uh, he was a prisoner who had a acceptable responsibility of being sort of a, a butler there. And the scripture says that when he heard the news of how the walls were broken down in Jerusalem and the gates were burned, and here he was hundreds of miles away in Babylonian captivity, that he just wept and wept and wept, and his heart was broken over the whole situation. And he says, And it came to pass when I heard these things that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now. Day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned and dealt corruptly against thee. Listen, that's the kind of prayers the leadership of this nation needs to pray. Anyway, Nehemiah began to pray. He didn't say a word to anybody. He fasted and prayed and besought the Lord day and night. Now, he had to fulfill his responsibilities before the king. But the second chapter says he came in before the king. When then the king says, what's the matter with you, Nehemiah? You look down in the heart. Your spirits grieve. What's the matter with you? And that's exactly what Nehemiah had been wanting somebody to ask him at the right time. And so he opened his heart. He said, my people are dispersed. They're scattered. My God is, is shamed by the dispersion of my people. The city of Jerusalem, God's holy city, the walls are broken down, the gates are all burned, and my heart is grieved for my people. And the king said, listen, watch this. Here is a heathen Babylonian king who doesn't even believe in the God of Nehemiah. Here is a man who's a servant and a slave to the king. And the king of Babylon, under the sovereign control and the power of the almighty God, who is our almighty God today, said to him, Nehemiah, what can I do for you? And Nehemiah said, I'd like to go back. I'd like to see my people revive. You know what he did? He gave him a work order. And that work order said that every, all, the, all the supplies that he needed, all the people he needed, and all the time he needed, and all the protection he needed to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the gates, that he had not only the king's supplies, he had the king's blessing and the king's protection. That is a demonstration of what happens when God's people fast and pray in concern for God's work. Now, friend, when they got desperate, God moved. And the problem in America is we're not desperate. We still think we're going to pull it off, and we're not. I can guarantee you God isn't going to let this nation pull off anything except repentance and confession and humiliation before him. And you know where that starts? My heart, your heart, and the hearts and the families and the homes all over this nation. When people pray, things begin to happen. Well, let me just go through just two or three things quickly that I've already mentioned about what happens. The first thing that happens when God's people begin to fast and pray is a sharpening of the mind. There is nothing that makes the mind so keen, nothing that gives such clear sight as fasting. It peels off. Every hour you and I are fasting and praying is peeling off one layer of fog and haze where we're able to see the innermost being of what God is thinking. Able to see ourselves as we've never seen ourselves before. Able to see those around us as we have never been able to feel their feelings and see their condition. We're able to understand scripture like we've never understood it before able to get the mind of God, able to discern his will. And most of all, the supernatural power of God is strangely, miraculously, but definitely released when God's people are willing to humble themselves before him, bring themselves in subjection to him and say, God, I can't, but you can. More important to me than food, more important to me than any intimate relationships of any kind, any need that I have, more important than that is my relationship to you that I find what you're saying to me. And friend, we have the privilege of watching God do a supernatural work in our midst. The greatest work will be in our hearts. And it's my prayer that God will burden your heart that you'll never be satisfied 
with less than the maximum of your potential for him. Now, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for giving us the examples of fasting and praying all through the scripture, and there's so many of them. We thank you for that beautiful chapter of Isaiah 58 that describes how we ought to go about fasting. And I pray that many today will commit themselves to prayer groups. Many today will commit themselves to begin to fast and to pray and to seek your face, confessing and repenting of sin, that you may be able to use each and every one of us and all of us together in small groups in a great body and a whole nation of people, that through all of us you may demonstrate your supernatural power, that you're alive, that you're God, that you're sovereign, that everything on this earth and everything beyond it is under your perfect control. I pray for somebody here today, Father, who is unsaved, for they cannot pray except they first pray for mercy and forgiveness and cleansing and salvation. I pray for fathers and mothers who have families who ought to be a part of this fellowship, who ought to join this fellowship and grow up with us in understanding the truth of the scriptures and growing in their life and providing the teaching and the admonition and the nurture of their families that will bring about strength and stability and stalwartness and mighty in spirit. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake.